once you get a transplant you're cured for life is that true well, it's true because li- well again it's one of those things that need a bit of definition what is the most critical moment during a transplant surgery heart and lung transplant is actually not the actual surgery if you will neither the surgeon the donor or the recipient it's a time in between only young people can get transplant not at all we've taken away the upper age limit there's no upper age limit as such it's your physiological age which is important Today I have with me Dr. Khumat Kumar Dital who is an internationally acclaimed cardiothoracic and transplant surgeon with over 25 years of experience. He is also the head of heart and lung transplant program at the Apollo Hospitals Chennai. Doctor thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, doctor can you tell us about the awareness programs regarding heart and lung transplant in India? I mean the heart and lung well the heart transplant program in India is actually very old. You know the f- I think was a fourth heart transplant ever done was done in India. But over the years and certainly in the last I'd say in the last 5 years or so it has grown significantly but really only in about two or three centers and we are way under serving the need of the nation. So as globally transplants if you look at it is probably serving even in the best places a tenth of the requirement and in India it's way less. So how do we increase uh this the donation regulatory authorities controlling donations are becoming increasingly better i would say but not all states have it to the same extent and there are lots of reasons there is a misunderstanding or a a low level of understanding about thoracic transplants heart and lung transplants the benefit thereof because we're not we don't have enough recipient survivors in the communities where donations are occurring and that is your best ambassador to let people be aware that the therapy has value and is able to return who people who were very sick that you noticed who are now back leading a normal life often going back to work you know being with their families instead of being a burden and i think one of the misunderstandings has been the lack of appreciation of teamwork and heart and lung transplantation i would argue even the other transplants but this particularly so because of the need for very high end intensive care and experience and expertise requires a multidisciplinary team like an orchestra that all the instruments play the same tune right under a conductor and that's not happening to the extent that we would wish and uh, do we have enough awareness programs for this listen there there are lots of awareness programs and not only are individual hospitals like apollo doing their own programs locally and nationally across its network it being such a large vast network in india with over 10000 beds but there are institutions like the mohan foundation which again is a, you know started off here in tamil nadu doing extensive national work in trying to inform the public about the value of organ donation so there are many things we need to do but you're right one is clearly one of informing not just the public but also our own professional colleagues who often uh, do not realize actually the value of the transplant in terms of survivorship of patients if they're doing well into the long term so you spoke about uh, you know the value of these transplants What is that one uh, story that stuck with you? 2014 after many years of research and you know doing these transplants in animals and so on in Sydney when I was where I was then um, we did and I performed the first series of DCD heart transplants and that is now you know what 11 years ago more than 11 years ago and some of those patients are still, the first patients still alive doing well that 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 is enormous value and the other one is to see young patients who go back to a normal quality of life and as i said earlier to you are contributing to their family welfare and to that of the society you know there can't be anything greater than that and all through just the gift a simple free gift of uh, organs that you don't need when you pass away from here to somewhere else i've been talking to a lot of people the one thing that uh, everyone kept asking me is that uh, when a patient comes to you how do you you know decide that 
this patient requires a heart or a lung transplant? Yeah. What is the process that is involved? That is fairly straightforward. We know and most doctors can differentiate uh, absolutely well that this is either a heart only or a lung or a combined disease process, right? But it's recognizing the time when patients should be referred to a more specialist center and more experienced care. And that's one of the difficulties I, I find in India is that whilst certainly in the West, there has been now for you know over maybe a couple of decades now an understanding that advanced heart and lung failure, advanced organ failure, are niches in their own right with enormous populations to serve. I feel that here perhaps a lot of physicians, you know, they're jack of all trades, many of, of them, and feel that th this is something they're quite good at handling. But it's not converting into the right time of referral of these patients. So we're seeing patients being referred very late in their disease process, mm. which makes several things very difficult. One is that we as a transplant team, if we feel that transplantation is appropriate, need time to build trust with the patient because essentially they're relying on us. And unfortunately, transplantation is also an expensive therapy. So to be told when you're arriving this late that yes, you need a transplant and it's going to cost you this much and this is how you will quality of life will change, but it also means you have to do certain disciplined things to maintain your chance of survivorship into the long term. It's just too much of a shock to that individual and their family. We have not had that dialogue slowly over months to say, listen, you're a bit early, let's see you in three months, let's see you in six months, your doctor's doing the right thing and creating this sort of tripod of trusted relationship. So what are the signs uh, or, uh, you know, the conditions that is something which is important that cannot be, you know, ignored? Well, this is where the difficulty lies because the signs and symptoms early on could be masking for so many other diseases of the heart and lungs, right? And it's only as you progress the amount of medication you're requiring. It typically starts with shortness of breath, right, or, or chest pain. or But typically lethargy, ch difficulty exercising, doing your daily routine activities, which for those that are, you know, plus 55, 60, are beginning to put it down to old age. And it really isn't because that's... I've, I've very, grown old. Yeah, grown that's old. very... That's a, such a common thing I hear. A 60-year-old who comes, oh, but doc, I'm old now, 60. And... Uh, but that's so young, you know. If you say, well, wh what were you doing two years ago, five years ago? And you notice it was completely different, chalk and cheese. And so people have different expectations depending on which country you're in at a certain age about their health, about their longevity, and also what the family thinks they should be contributing or not. And uh, that's a fascinating mix. And uh, you talked about preparing a patient, yes. having that dialogue and yeah. discussion. Mm. You know, before such a major surgery, what, what exactly is the procedure that is followed? There are two aspects to it. One is that we as a team need to inform the patient about what's happening. And one of the first questions I often get is, Doctor, why should I have a lung transplant if I'm only going to survive one year? And I typically say, if you were only going to survive one year, I would not be offering you this therapy because that would be foolish because it costs the time to recover, so on, doesn't make any sense. And the reason why transplantation cannot be determined just by me being the head of the program is that everybody has a veto. We put not only this head-to-toe workup that's done, looking at every organ, literally everything, to discover if there's any hidden disease, particularly cancer or other diseases, that might put at risk the, the life of this patient if he was to have a transplant. But don't forget, we have two responsibilities. We have a responsibility to the recipient to keep them as li alive as long as possible. But we also have, as a transplanting team, a responsibility for the donor and to try and make sure that the match is such that the donated organ also survives as long as possible. What is the most critical moment during a transplant surgery? The most critical moment for heart and lung transplant is actually not the actual surgery, if you will, and neither the surgeon, the donor, or the recipient. It's the time in between. So the ischemic time, the time when blood has stopped flowing into the organs in the donor to when the blood starts flowing again in the recipient. It's a very critical time, and different organs have different resilience to that ischemic time. I, ischemia meaning no blood flow, right? So no oxygen or blood flowing. And 
uh, kidneys can survive longer than livers and lungs are not bad they can you know survive several heart ideally the heart should be plumbed in that time should be less than four hours but there are exceptions a young donor into a good recipient you can extend that a lot bit longer so that is critical and then there is a whole for heart and lung the conduct of surgery is clearly important but it's the post-operative care in the intensive care unit because the heart and lung patients can succumb within minutes if something isn't you're not vigilant uh, whilst it's not the same time-wise in terms of literally minutes for other organs and so that vigilance requires an expertise to understand and appreciate a good trend good beneficial trend and a downtrend which is more critical you want to treat the trend and correct the trend and not an event by the time an event occurs you're really having to dig yourself out of a hole so can you share an example of where a patient has a overcome any kind of difficulty after post surgery or a complication absolutely and it's not always plain sailing it's through not through lack of effort or want sometimes people things are just unlucky so patients for lungs for example they might get an infection and it might be a fungal infection that will put them in hot and on the ventilator for longer they'll be in the icu for longer and the longer you are bed bound the longer that rehabilitation process is for them to be on their own feet to be going home and hearts some hearts that may not just fly off and you can't wean them from the heart lung machine and you have to support them for a while on artificial circulation so all these are complications they're accepted complications the later you are referred the more likely you are to run into these problems mm. and complications how does life change after a transplant yeah for the majority it's really is transformative in that they do return to a normal quality of life albeit with a bag full of medicines they've got their own medicine cabinet you know and the vigilance of this hygiene that a lot of us learned over covid so hygiene contact staying away from dust and pollution being careful of children with coughs and colds trying to avoid pets and pigeons and living in a house that hopefully has got you know electricity running water you don't have damp and mold all these things that add added risk whilst you are immunosuppressed after transplant your defenses are down so you need to have that extra vigilant and more protective environment to do well to survive into the medium and long term so this lifestyle change is forever correct for life what has been your experience in dealing with these uh, patients your patients transplant patients were they able to do the same things that they used to do earlier yeah yeah absolutely so majority go back and some depending on the age so the young young guys majority go back to work the older ones who retired and so on go back to routine quality of life and the others in between some who choose not to go back to work they found a new lease of life they want to spend time with their families and so on and that's not to say there aren't certain individuals who benefit but not as well they may not be as great as they used to be but at least they're looking out they're independent and able to be in the family but they might not be you know running around there is also a lot of misinformation about uh, transplants particularly so here uh, there are a couple of things uh, which uh, nitin who is the producer of this show came up with saying uh, you have to be on your deathbed before you get you can get a transplant is that true well yes and no i mean you put, you put when you put it that way the point is as i go back to saying is the patients refer too late so they're already being let me t- t- take lungs for instance mm-hmm. patients be often being referred when they can no longer do a 6 minute walk test they cannot do a lung function test which in many centers would actually stop them being candidates for lung transplantation so we're seeing really the very sick end of of the cohort and that shouldn't be it should be a protective strategy to get them back to life earlier on than life and, and quality of life by virtue of a interactive trust growing relationship and then the therapy being given to them in a timely fashion because patients are put on a wait list right it's not something that comes off a shelf sadly unfortunately and the sad part about all of this actually is that somebody's got to die it's a very crude science and crude therapy that we have to rely on somebody else's death in order to save some save someone else misinformation is once you get a transplant cured for life is that true oh, well it's true because li- well again it's one of those things that need a bit of definition so transplant is good for your entire life but your life is whatever you have in front of you if you're going to die in 2 weeks time it's still giving you a life the question here is really what you're getting at is life is 
normal life, right? So that needs a little bit of explanation. So we want patients to return not only to, there are two things why we're doing this. We're trying to get rid of patients' symptoms, which is causing them harm, causing them discomfort, and we want them to return to as near normal a lifespan as possible. The next one is a donor's personality or memories can be transferred with the organ. This is a very common thing that's there on the internet. So it, it is, and it's, it, it, it's it, you, have to, you can take it several ways. I mean, I've never come across it. Right. I've never come across a patient who's either described changing their food habit or their m music interest or anything else. But there appears to be plenty out there. So with a different hat on now, really? I, no, I'm, what I'm trying to say is we forget that there are nerve cells. There are more nerve cells in your gut than there are in your brain almost. And there are nerve cells also in your heart. So when you say, I feel it in my gut and I feel it in my heart, it may all be possible. And now we're, there's a whole mixture of, an, of uh, different theories of where memory is laid in, in cellular memory. We don't know. So I, I mean, there are enough anecdotes out there to think, you know, maybe there's something there, but I personally, nor my colleagues, have come across it in any meaningful way. Okay, so there's another myth that is only young people can get transfer. Not at all. Absolutely not at all. In fact, the upper age limit now for heart and lungs at least, and in fact, livers and kidneys you can do even older. We've, we've taken away the upper age limit because... Ooh. Absolutely. There's no upper age limit as such. It's your physiological age, which is important. You know, you have a 70-year-old. I mean, the oldest heart transplant I've done is over 74. Mm -hmm. Same with lungs, 75. It depends on if the 75-year-old is looking, functioning like a 65-year-old. That's the age they're really at in respect of their transplantation. Their Correct. And how they will do postoperatively and how will they recover and end up going back. So, it's targeted at your functional physiological age and not so much your chronological age. So the next question is, if you are an organ donor, doctors won't try to try as hard to save you. Won't. No, no, this is a complete, uh, very much of a misunderstanding. It's not that if you are a donor, well, you're not a donor until you are brain dead or circulatory dead. Nobody is considering you to be anything else. I mean, all colleagues I know are working tirelessly to keep everybody alive as much as possible. It differs from one hospital to another hospital or one patient to another patient or from government to a private? Maybe doctors have a different kind of opinion on that? Well, I, I think the, we should note that, I mean, a lot of the donations are coming out of government hospitals. In fact, they could probably provide even more, but they, you know, they're, they're so jam-packed, they're so crowded, they're so already overworked, and they have limited resources, and they have limited uh, beds. And do you continue to care for somebody who's brain dead, or do you, in the hope of them becoming a good donor, or do you try and save somebody who's just come in, who can be saved and returned to life? These are very difficult questions, and you have to be really there to understand uh, what the doctors are facing, particularly in the e emergency department, in the critical care scenario, how the managers are coping with this infrastructural and, and their burden of disease that's bringing patients. So I'm not sure that that really is influenced. Um, it's possible when you hear the newsprint that there clearly is every now and then something will crop up, up some scandal about transplant and so on. Mm. So I'm not saying that the entire ecosystem of transplants, I'm extending this out of the heart and lung because we necessarily have to rely on deceased organs. But for livers and kidneys, you know, you hear these things in the news that crop up. And so you have to question and, and you know, and hopefully our, our leaders out there who are administering our societies and so on can come up with better solutions. Thank you so much for uh, talking to us and explaining uh, to our viewers about uh, certain complicated things, but at the same time, keeping it very simple. Thank you. Sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you.